We've got experience with Zoom, so I'm sure we're in good hands. There we go. I see the recording button. Thank you. I appreciate you taking those tasks on. That's wonderful. Okay. So we're ready to go here. Um, I'm going to give an introduction of myself and tell you a little bit about myself. This is not going to be like a webinar thing where I'm going to be here for 20 minutes. I'm going to take 90 seconds. Most of the people on here already know me at least a little bit. Um, but for people who are watching the video or some of you who may not know, let me give you just a little short background and you'll see why um, I'm qualified to teach this. Um, my name, for everybody, hopefully you already know that, is Ed Akers. Um, I have been uh, doing entrepreneurial type work since the mid 80s. Um, a long time. I've worked for myself since 1985. Um, I come from the offline world. Obviously, I come from before the days of text messaging and, and webinars and Zoom meetings. Um, so everything we used to do, we used to do through phone calls and offline advertising. And if any of you folks around my age remember the old internet bulletin boards, you know, things like that. Um, so we used to do this exact same thing with different ways. And I always say the more things change, the more they stay the same. So the fundamentals have not changed since the mid 80s. The technology has, uh, some of the buyers have gotten a little more savvy and we may need to use different language and different things, but the fundamentals have not changed. Um, my background is actually as a paralegal in the corporate structuring world. And I switched over to marketing when the clients that I would structure corporations for set up situations in their companies would then come to me and go, well, now you got me all set up. I'm ready to go. How do I get customers? And so I kind of, <laughs> I, I learned that by default by helping them. And eventually I sold that company and went into doing this kind of stuff full time. Um, who is this? Uh, who is this? <laughs> Simon works with teletype. Oh my goodness. Um, so who is this meeting? That's really all I'm going to say about myself. I, I do mostly software now, but I still work with my local businesses. Um, yesterday I signed up a barber. We're going to help him get customers. So I do this stuff all the time. So enough about me. Now a little bit about you all. Who is this for? Um, most of the people on this call are either partners in a software product of mine or partners in associated software companies that I work with. But that's not just who this is for. Um, although some of my comments today, a lot of them will be geared right towards you folks. Um, but it's mostly going to be for any business to business kind of sales. The same principles apply if you're a business to consumer, if you're a realtor or a hairdresser or a, uh, you know, therapeutic masseuse or something like that. These principles will work and I will use some examples and scenarios from the B2C world as well. Um, but most of what I'm going to talk about is B2B. If, if that's not you, you're still going to get a lot out of this. Pay attention and I will give some answers, uh, some examples in your world as well. Um, so with that said, let's dive in. Let me give you a quick overview of what I'm going to talk about, and then I'm going to switch over and share my screen. Um, I'm going to share my screen to, uh, you know, type some notes and take some notes, and then I'll come back on camera for the Q&A. First, we're going to talk about what is a funnel. Um, some people are little, don't even really know what a funnel is, or they have misconceptions about it. Um, then we want to talk about the elements of a funnel. What pieces do you need to have to put in place? Then we're going to talk about how to choose a niche, and not just a niche, but a sub-niche, and then a sub-sub-niche, and then a sub-sub-niche. And you'll understand when we get into that why that is so extremely important. And then we're going to talk about how to find your target market. And I don't just mean an avatar. Um, I mean an actual very specific target market. And then we're going to talk about taking that niche and that target market and finding what their problems are, their specific pain points, the damage those pain points are causing to them, especially if they don't fix them and correct them. Um, and we're going to talk about the language that that particular market uses in their industry and how to discover that. Um, then we're going to talk about the solution. You know, what's a simple, quick, easy solution that's within their price point that you can show them that you can provide to them and how do you match that problem and solution. We're going to talk about that. And that's really the key to all of it. Then we're going to talk about creating an irresistible offer. But if you've done the problem and the solution correctly with a targeted market in the proper sub niche, that'll handle itself. Um, then we're going to talk about designing ads and sales pages. I'm not going to talk a lot about that. I'm just going to talk about principles. We're not going to, you know, actually build one and collecting data, getting data. And um, then we're going to talk a little bit about thank yous, pages, upsells, downsells, bump offers, uh, cross-marketing, cross-promotion, and then we're going to talk about post-sale marketing. 
uh, repeat business and creating advocates from your customers. And then lastly, we're going to close up with then what, which is going to be all about scaling. Um, so we've got quite a bit on our plate. Some of these sections will take a little time to go through. Some will only be a couple of minutes. Um, so with that said, let me see if I'm going to need Mark to give me permission to share my screen. Host disabled attendee screen sharing. Do you know how to turn that on, Mark? If not, I can tell you. I can walk you through it. If you hit the, there should be a more button. And it would be under the screen share options and allow participants to share. And if you click that, then we should be good. There we go. We're good. You got it. Thank you. Okay. So, can, oops, that is the wrong screen. <laughs> Let's try this again. Uh, here we go. Okay. Uh, oh, why is it going there? <laughs> well, there we go. Can everyone, does everyone see a page that says designing the perfect funnel? Or are you seeing something different? See it. Okay, beautiful. All right, so I'm just going to take some notes here while I'm talking, and then I'll come back on uh, camera for the Q&A. So, what is it? What is a funnel? Let me. If if you're muted, unmute yourself for a minute. I'd like to get some feedback and see whatever. See what everybody thinks a funnel is, or what knows a funnel is. What is your idea of a funnel in marketing? A funnel is where you bring all of the people who are potential clients, customers, etc., into the top of said structure. And then they are guided through a particular pathway, which allows for segmentation and or um, identifying the real buyers. And they exit the funnel at the bottom of the funnel. Okay, that's pretty good. Anybody want to add anything to that? Yeah, I'll add. Um... I think also a funnel is a value exchange. You're giving somebody something for them coming into your funnel. And, uh, and there's different ways of doing that. Excellent point. Anybody want to add anything to that? Very good. Both of those are absolutely correct. Anything else? Anybody want to add anything? All right. We've got a pretty savvy crowd here. All right. Here's my definition of a funnel. It's a tool used to bring potentially ideal customers or clients to a point of connection and beyond. That's it. So it talks about what Mark talked about, bringing those potential ideal customers in. Um, when I say a point of connection, I mean exactly uh, what I believe it was David said. It's a mutual exchange of value. You know, it's not just they buy something from you. It's actually connecting with them. Um, but most people see funnels as this, you know, it, it looks like a funnel where at the top it's wide and at the bottom it's narrow, and that's it. But I look at it more as a circle. So um, someone comes into your funnel, and they go through your funnel, and then they go back through your funnel, or they give you referrals because they're your advocate now, and they send other people through your funnel. So it becomes a circle. Um, so I'm going to actually put that up here. It's a tool used – oops, it would help if uh, – there we go. Sorry about that. <laughs> a tool used, because this is a good, uh, good thing to understand, and we're going to cover each little part of this as we go, to bring potentially ideal, I'm just going to put clients, but it could be customers if you're, uh, if you're providing a product uh, rather than having clients, to a point of, con of connection. All right, this is really important. Um, you've got to be able to connect with them, and you'll see why that's important in the types of funnels I designed and why that's what this, – this is really what allows you to scale, that point of connection. If you're just selling things to people, you can scale, but it'll be slow. It's this connection point that really makes a big difference. Um, now, funnels don't have to just be online, okay? So when you're bringing somebody – when it says you're bringing these potentially ideal clients in – um, it doesn't have to be online. It could be a flyer, an advertisement, a TV commercial, word of mouth, a referral program. Um, could be a billboard. So keep that in mind also. And keep in mind, 
Um, when you're designing your funnel, you're going to be taking this to unknown people. Okay, you're going to be making them aware of you. You're going to be making them aware of your brand, your products, your services. Um, and then you're going to, as, as Mark said, entice them to follow a course of action that will bring them to some predetermined point. Um, it doesn't matter if that initial point that you're bringing them to is a free ebook or a $20 million jet. The funnel principles are all exactly the same. Okay, I actually had a, a, a old client of mine. He was a, a salesman and he sold uh, coach works. For private jets. So you would go to Boeing or somewhere and you would buy your jet shell and he would handle all of the coach works. Well, when he's out there, he's also looking for people to buy jets. And I said, how often do you get a sale? And he said, only once every two or three years. Um, so he's got a long-term funnel, but of course his commissions were high enough that he could do that. Um, so just keep in, the, in, in mind, all these principles apply no matter what you're doing. Also remember a funnel is just a tool. Okay, it's it's a tool. It's nothing more than that. A tool is only as good as the person wielding that tool, and it's only as good as the situation for which it was designed. If you use a, you know, a hammer to repair a motherboard, um, it's not going to work so well. Um, so just keep that in mind. Th these are just tools. These are not the end all be all. I see people buying pre-built funnels. Um, it, <laughs> it makes me shudder a little bit. Um, I understand why people do that. But it's just a tool, and, it, and if you design it yourself for your own purposes, it's going to be more effective. Um, by the time we've, we're finished with this class, you will know exactly how to build that perfect tool for yourself and how to implement it and use it. You'll also see why broad funnels, like copy and paste funnels, or if you buy a pre-built funnel from someone, is not really what you want. Um, it might be a, a starting point. It may be a way to learn the technical fundamentals of how things work if you don't know, but it's really not what you want. You don't want to copy somebody else's funnel. I see a lot of people, they get involved in a program, and the first thing they ask is, do you have funnels for us? Um, and, and I just cringe. Um, you'll see by the time we're done why you don't want to do that. Um, I'm not, I think this is going to be quick on questions, so I'm not going to stop my screen share yet. Does anybody, that's the end of the first section. I want to talk about the elements of a funnel. Does anybody have any questions on what I mean by a funnel? Is that, is that clear to everyone or does anybody have any questions? Okay, awesome. So let's talk about the elements of a funnel, right? If you go to a community college and you take a marketing course, they're going to give you these elements of a funnel and they're going to be very broad and general and philosophical. And I'm going to go through, there are five of them that they teach in colleges, and I'm going to go through those, but I'm going to sh show you how they tie to what you actually need in place, okay? Um, <laughs> when they talk about elements, what they really mean are stages of that funnel, where a person is in that funnel. But I also want to talk about what you need to put in place physically or virtually if it's online to accomplish and, and walk the people through that stage. Um, all of these things you need to keep in mind when you're building the funnel and when you're going through the, the processes. So the first step that they teach you is awareness, okay? Um, the first stage, I said step, what I meant is, is stage, is, um, whoops, awareness, all right? That's when people don't know you. You know, they don't know you have a product. They don't know you have a solution. Maybe they've never heard of you, but through some effort, you're making them aware of what you have, okay? Um, and the puzzle pieces that you're going to need to get through the awareness stage are things like ads, maybe a Facebook ad, um, maybe um, a blog post, maybe a Google ad, uh, maybe a billboard. Who knows? Maybe you're going to want to go into the offline world, but it's the awareness stage is accomplished by finding tools that put your information in front of people. Um, and the information that you need to make them aware of is that they have a problem and that you have the solution. Those are the two most important things to make people aware of. You can say, hey, I've got, well, I'm going to use software as an example. I've got software for sale. It does this, it does that, it does this, it does that. We love our software, right? That doesn't mean anything to anybody. They don't care about that. But if you say, hey, I understand you're having an issue with A and I can solve that and you're having an issue with B and I can solve that, now all of a sudden they're going to perk up and pay attention. So when we're talking about awareness, that's what I'm talking about, is making people aware that, that you have the solution to their problem. And if they don't know they have a problem, then that's also part of the awareness is to make them aware that they even have that problem in the first place. I'll use realtors. I do a lot with realtors. I'll use them as an example for a second. Let's say 
a realtor takes two days to get back with a client. They might think that's normal in their industry. Maybe that's a standard practice for the people in their brokerage. But if you can point out to them buying habits of people in their market and when they search online that when they put out that content request form, if they don't hear back from somebody in a few minutes, they're on somebody else's page. They're filling out another contact request form. And the first one to get in touch with that person gets the business. Well, as soon as they realize that's a problem, i.e. them waiting, and that you have the solution and can put them in, in front of those people immediately, now that's the kind of awareness I'm talking about. Make them aware of those problems. All of a sudden, they'll feel that pain and you've got the solution. Um, awareness can be done. I'm going to read a couple of these I've written down. Advertising, content marketing, word of mouth, um, a well-designed referral program could be a good way to get awareness out there. Um, and what you want this to be is a loop. So always think referral programs because when somebody comes through your funnel, you want to convert them not just to a client or a customer, but into an advocate. So they go feed other people through that funnel for you and it becomes a loop. So you want to not only make them aware you have the problem and solution, but make them aware that it's so good that they need to go share that with other people. Um, it's very crucial, too, to address this to your target market. And we're going to talk about identifying that target market. I'm going to spend some time developing that a little later in this class. Um, I'm not going to get into how to do an ad or how to design, you know, the perfect referral for program or anything like that. We can certainly do another class on that. Um, but make sure that when you write those or when you create those, it's to a specific target. Um, Keep in mind your only goal. There's no other goal than to make sure that they know you have a solution to their problem. Um, so I'm actually going to put that. Goal is uh, make them aware you have the solution. And I'll give everybody a copy of this document when we're, when we're done. You have the solution. And I'm going to put this in capital letters to their problem. They don't care about their neighbor's problem, even their competitor's problem. They only care about their problem. You have a solution to their problem. Um, that's important. So the next thing that we have in the next stage of a funnel is called consideration. Okay. This is when people have been made aware of a problem. They've been made aware that you have a solution and you've given them something to consider. Uh, it could be in the form of an offer. It might be a sales page. Um, it could be a video. It could be an ebook that's designed maybe to, to get people to consider taking your product or service, um, from you. Um, it could be a, a you all know what I'm talking about in a second. It could be a webinar disguised as content, you know, a sales webinar disguised as content. We've all been on those, right? Um, but it's something for people to consider. We are going to spend some time on this element a little bit later because um, this is where you can really begin to develop that conversation in the mind of the, the potential client. It's not just about selling them something. It's about getting them actually involved in the process. Um, the key to success when implementing this element is to make sure you address their problem and hit their pain points, okay, and make them very well aware that you have the best solution. So um, I'm going to just put here, get a conversation going in their mind. This is really important. A perfect sales page, a great copywriter, will. that's exactly what they do, okay? So um, <clears throat> keep that in mind. And I'm going to use a, a friend of mine growing up had a saying. He said, be specific, be terrific. And um, I love it. Okay. That's just a great phrase. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it applies so much to this situation. Okay. Be specific, be terrific. If you don't have their problem specific, if you don't have the solution specific, if you don't have the items for them to consider very, very specific, um, you're, going to have, you're not going to have as terrific results as you could. If you can do this well, be really specific about identifying that, all their objections fall away, okay? Um, you'll get a really high percentage of conversion. And usually if an objection arises, okay, if somebody's looking at it and they're going, eh, I don't know, I don't sure they hit that buy button, I'm just not sure. Um, usually when that happens, either you haven't hit the pain points well enough, you haven't identified the problem well enough, um, or the person that you've exposed to the consideration is not your ideal target. That's quite possible, too. Um, or perhaps the problems you've identified don't have a high enough pain point to justify them taking that action. Okay, so we're going to talk about pain points a little bit later and how to find them. Um, the next one is conversion. Okay, once you've gotten them to, to consider what you have, you need to convert them. This is usually nothing more than a buy button on a page or download ebook or, you know, buy this. 
Um, this is actually the point of decision. That's what we're talking about. And if you've done your, your stages of awareness cons and consideration well, and you've been specific, and you've identified their pain points, that conversion is very easy to get. Um, we're not gonna spend a lot of time on this particular aspect of the funnel, but if you're not getting the results that you want, and you're convinced that you've done you know, everything that we've gone through before and that we're gonna go through later, um, then do split tests and find out where the issue is. Test the pricing, change the color of the buy button, offer payment plans, change the refund, change the guarantee. If you know you've hit the pain points, you've done your homework that we're gonna talk about a little bit later, and you know they're, they're super hot for your market, you're still not getting the results, then it could be something very technical. And then you can start doing split testing uh, if you're not happy with it. I'm just gonna make one comment um, if not happy with the results. I'm gonna make just one comment about split testing one thing at a time. Split test one thing at a time. If you go, it's not working, and you, you change the image, the video, the headline, the buy button color, and you, you put it in a different font, and it works great, now you have no idea what it was that did that. So just something to keep in mind. Okay, the next thing is loyalty, all right? You wanna create loyalty. Um, really important, and this is where most people drop the ball. A lot of people think of a funnel, like we were talking earlier, as creating that awareness, presenting that offer, and then the person you know, makes that connection to the point where they buy your product, and that's the end of the funnel. Hey, I got the sale, yay, or maybe they think of an upsell or downsell. You really wanna look at loyalty. Most people think once you've got the sale and you've got the customer, the work's done, and now just deliver that service or product. Nothing could be further from the truth, not in a, in a funnel that you wanna scale. Um, let me ask everybody a question. I know somebody on here is gonna know the answer to this. When is the best time to get somebody to open up their wallet to give you money? Right now. <laughs> yes. And right now meaning? How about when they just gave you money? I mean, think of the fast food thing. Do you want fries with that? Is it easier to get the extra money for fries when they've already placed an order or when they first walk in the door? Right? Right when they've given you money. They're happy. They've got that emotional high from purchasing something. Um, so that's the easiest time, okay? So when I'm talking about loyalty, I'm talking about repeat business. I'm talking about customer satisfaction. I'm talking about emotions. I'm talking about converting that person from just buying something to becoming a loyal customer. Well, one of the easiest ways to do that is to get them to buy something else, okay? Um, it also gets your profit margins to jump. There was an article in the Harvard, uh, Harvard Business Review, I think like 2015, 2016, and they said, let me read this, it said, profits rise as a customer's relationship with a company lengthens. Okay, so even though they're just your customer now, how do you start developing that relationship? Well, the easiest thing to do right away is get them to buy something else, okay? So, and the more you do that, the profits rise. And do you know why? You got that extra sale without extra ad cost or without paying an additional referral fee or without spending extra time, you know, retargeting them through Facebook ads. Um, so it, it's, it's, you get a higher, higher profit percent, percentage. Um, but also the some of the top reasons that happens is um, not only do you not have to spend the time and money taking them through that awareness stage and that consideration stage, but because they already know and trust you to a certain degree. Would they have given you their money in the first place if they didn't? Probably not, right? So you don't have to spend as much time and effort on that consideration stage to get them to become a repeat customer to buy something else. And that increases the probability of more people going through that conversion stage on future, on future purchases, all right? Um, you got that like no trust factor. So you can, you can capitalize on it immediately by doing things like upsells, downsells, bump orders, and you can capitalize it over time by developing that relationship with that client. And then you can offer them other products or services that fit their needs and solve their problems. Um, if you're truly having a relationship, you can't just be a salesman to them. If you bring on somebody and they're a, a mortgage broker, you don't want to start selling them, you know, vacation packages. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's got to be, make sure you're <clears throat> treating them with respect. Everything's related. You'll keep them coming back for more if you do that. Um, <clears throat> on this note here, I've been doing offline marketing, which I've done for a lot of years. I've noticed something that brick and mortar um, places have is a problem and people online have the same problem but brick and mortars in particular when it comes to promotions okay they'll go out and they'll they'll get a Groupon or they'll do one of these Clipper magazine things that you've seen or, or something like that or they'll do an ad um, but they don't have anything to bring that customer back through the door 
after they've got that initial sale. And that's a big problem. Um, I, I met with a local barber yesterday. A friend of mine introduced me to a barber that just opened up a month ago up the street from here. And I went in and chatted with him for a bit and I brought him on um, as a client. I'm helping him and he's using some of our software now and stuff. But he didn't, he had, you know, he didn't know anything. And I said, well, what were you taught to do? Because, you know, he's, he's been a barber before, but not in his own location. And he said, well, I don't know. I just run coupons or run ads or try to, you know, talk to people. And so I said, well, we can do that, but then you're going to keep having to run those ads. So what I told him, I got him to understand the importance of that customer being a repeat customer to create that loyalty. So the suggestion I gave to him was, look, they just gave you money. They just came in. They just gave you money. The easiest time to get money is when they did that. Why don't you offer them 50% off on their next visit? You just gave them a haircut. Say, I'm going to give you 50% off on your next visit, but you have to do two things for me. You have to book that appointment now and you have to pay me up front. Pay me now for it, and it'll be prepaid, and I'll give you half off. His eyes lit up. He goes, that'll work. He goes, I know they'll do that, and, and I know they will too because we've done those programs before, and they work beautifully, and now that customer's already set to come back the second time. If they cancel and they don't do it, great. You made a little extra money. You got your you know money back that you lost on the promo, and you were actually paid full price, um, but if they do come back, now you get, they, they had a big offer the first time. Now they got a little offer, now offer them an even smaller incentive for that third one. Hey, you come back next time, here's a $2 off coupon for your third visit. Well, now they've been there three times, probably once a month for three months. Now you have a loyal customer. You don't need to offer them any more incentives. They love you. They love the work you're doing. They're happy with it. They're going to, you know, come back to you. So um, you need to keep that, you know, those types of offers have a, have a really high conversion rate because of the like, no, and trust factors. So when you're designing a funnel after the sale, think of those things. What can you do to keep that loyalty up? Because there's so much easier to get money from by continuing that relationship and you get money from them by solving their problems. So you're happy because you're making money and they're happy because you continue to solve additional problems for them. It's a win-win situation if you're doing it correctly. Um, and, and you get them hooked and then they're loyal and they'll keep coming back. Um, so keep them coming back. Um, all right, so the next part after loyalty is advocacy. Oops. Really important. This is a super important step. Um, you can turn that loyal client into an advocate. This is where you can get them to give you testimonials, word of mouth, uh, develop a referral program for people like that. And now they're bringing people back into this awareness stage of your funnel. They're telling their family and friends and, and things like that. Uh, the barber I saw yesterday gave me a t-shirt on the way out the door. Here's a t-shirt. He says he gives one to every customer um, and he's going to do it. He bought a thousand t-shirts. He's going to do it till he runs out. It's a good way to get the word out. You know, if people like what you do, they'll wear that shirt. They'll become your advocate. Um, if you don't have some type of a program in place to encourage this ad advocacy, um, at the very least, get and post testimonials from people. Again, they love you right at the time of purchase. When's the best time to get a testimonial? Right at the time of purchase. Most of the people on here either have or have access to um, a software called Sticky Reviews. My recommendation is put a link on your thank you page to a sticky reviews page where they can type something in or record a video right there while they're hot after the sale. And that video will go up. And as you all know, or if you don't know, you know, we'll tell you, um, if it's a one or two or three star, then that information goes to you and you can correct the problem. If it's a four or five, it'll go up on the website wherever you tell it to go. So put thing, if you don't have that tool, that's fine. There are lots of them out there. Find something that does that. and Put that up there. That, that's a way to create that advocacy. Get that testimonial and get it right when they make that sale. Um, and if they don't give it to you, then, you know, have them come back. I do a referral program for my offline clients. I tell them every customer that you bring to me that pays for at least one month and the value of their package is equal to or greater than yours, I give you a free month. So go out there and find me 12 business owners in your town and your next year of services from me is free. Um, and people love that. And that's a good way, you know, to encourage the advocacy. Um, and and that, that turns the funnel into a loop. Funnel into a loop. All right, so I'm going to um, stop this share just for a minute because that's the end of this little section here. Does anybody have any questions, comments, um, anything they'd like to add or anything they're not sure about? Okay. Does everybody like what they're getting so far? All right, good. I see lots of nodding heads. 
Excellent. Okay. So the next section we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about choosing a niche and selecting a sub niche and then selecting a sub sub niche and then dialing it in. Okay. So um, let me go back to sharing my screen because I'm going to actually, we're going to go out to a couple of websites here and I'm going to show you a couple of things. Um, so those were the elements. And actually, let me put that up here because I am going to um, give this to everybody if they want it. So that's a funnel. These are the elements. Okay. And what we're going to talk about now is I'll just put sub niche. Okay. Um, we want to find a niche. And let me give you an example of that. Okay. A niche is, a niche will be, for example, a hairdresser, right? Um, is a hairdresser a targeted niche? I see some heads nodding. I'm going to say no, it's not. It's a broad niche. How about um, a hairdresser uh, for women, which most of them are, but, you know, one, that, one is not a barber. They're a woman, uh, you know, for women. Um, is that a targeted niche? It's a little more targeted. What about one that specializes in dressing hair for brides? How's that? Or maybe proms. Do you think if you have a, a, an ad out there in the awareness stage, going back to the element, it says, hey, I can dress your hair, I can cut your hair, I can style it, and that's, that's the ad, that's the pitch, is that going to get as good a response as, hey, I know you've got a wedding coming up, I know you're really concerned about looking good, and I'm the perfect person to make sure you look the best. Is that going to get a better ad response? Absolutely. That's the importance of finding the sub-niche. Um, I see a lot of people in the software industry that they just want to get out there and build a page on software. I sell software. I have software. It text markets. It does this. It does that. That's great. Okay, that's marketing to the hairdresser, right? Will you get sales? Absolutely. But if you say, you know, I've got, um, you know, a specific software that helps you and in your industry, do maybe that realtor, you know, you don't even tell them the software. You just say, I have a tool it will get you in touch with that person that filled out your form about that house and put you on the phone with them in 90 seconds. Now you can, now you can have a high conversion rate because you're not selling software, you're selling a solution to a problem. And the only way you can identify those problems is to develop these sub niches um, and really dial them down. Let me give you another example. Let's do um, therapeutic massage, okay? Um, that's a niche, obviously. But what about one for athletes? Okay, they specialize in, in massages for, for um, athletes. That's a little bit better, right? But what about for tennis players? That's better. And you can run, maybe they take any athletes, but if you, do, if you do your awareness stage and design your funnel, at least one part of it for tennis players and another one for bowlers or you know, another one for swimmers and another one for football, kids in high school, another one for football kids in college, that type of thing. Those pages can all go down to the same type of, of conversion point, but your awareness and your consideration is going to be different. And I'll show you why in a minute when we talk about your target market, because you can start using their language better. But you can't do that unless you've identified that sub-niche first, which is why we're talking about this first. Um, so really important. Let's do another one. I do a lot of work. Um, with real estate agents. I have for years. Um, and that's great, okay? But that's just a really broad niche. Well, what about residential real estate agents, okay, versus um, commercial? Um, what about ones that specialize in waterfront homes, okay? And what about ones that specialize in waterfront homes that have piers or docks out front, okay? Now we're dealing with a really small sub-niche, but again, once we do that, we can identify our target market easier. We can identify the problems easier. We can better articulate the solutions. Okay, auto mechanics. I got a really good example of this one right here in my town. Um, people love to go out to reach auto mechanics. They're great people if you're in the software biz, by the way. Um, they need help marketing um, and they have the money to spend on it. Um, auto mechanics, at least the ones in my area, make really good money. Um, so we need to dial that down, right? What about foreign cars? <clears throat> okay, that's good. That's a little specialty. But what if they only specialize in BMWs? That's their specialty. 
can we dive that any deeper? Can anybody think of a way we can dive that niche one step deeper? Anybody? How about BMW certified? What can, what can a BMW dealer that's certified by BMW do that his competitors can't? Anybody know? He can compete with the dealership mechanics garage. It's always overpriced and expensive. Do you think we can find some pain points to the consumers, to our target audience with that BMW certification as opposed to somebody who just fixes BMWs? The guy up front at the top of my hill has a BMW repair shop. That's what he specializes in. And he was running for about a year and he was struggling. And he got his BMW certification and put BMW certified sign out front and his lot's been packed ever since. Same thing can happen to you with your funnels. If you can get that niche down to the point where you can absolutely identify that target audience better and, and narrow down their pain points, your funnel is gonna be a lot more productive. You're, a lot of people think, oh, but my awareness element is my awareness stage of the funnel is going to be so small because I'm not dealing with all the people that own cars. I'm only dealing with people that own BMWs that are still under warranty that want to go to the to the dealership. Well, great. If <laughs> spend better ad money now, you go. What's your conversion rate going to happen? Go from one percent to thirty percent? I'll take that all day long. Okay. Um, and then once you have that sub niche, I'm going to put this in capital letters because this is super important. And then I'll pull this up a little higher on the page. Once you have that sub niche, immerse yourself in it. Um, and people hate this, okay? Because what I'm going to tell you right now takes a little bit of work, okay? Um, join groups on the internet. Read blog posts. Buy magazines dealing with that target market or with that niche. And if you're worried about money, most libraries have magazine collections. And if they don't have one, you can ask your library to um, get that magazine. A lot of them will do that for you if they've got the budget for it. Um, buy books, befriend, befriend people in that niche. Go to that local BMW certified dealership and sit down and chat with the owner. Buy him lunch one day. Hey, I wanna pick your brain a little bit. What's your favorite restaurant in the area? When do you take lunch? Can I bring in your lunch for you and give me your lunch hour so I can chat with you and pick your brain? Do that kind of stuff. Um, get that dialogue going, whether it's in a, on a blog or in, through comments or a Facebook group or a forum or find that local business owner, immerse yourself in it. Um, this is where you really separate your funnel from people that just want to buy that cut and paste funnel. I just want to compete on price. Give me this pre-built funnel. I'm going to make it $10 cheaper than the next guy that bought the funnel. Are you going to make money? Maybe. If you do this, you will have a funnel that will attract people. Um, at least get them into that funnel because now you have an actual niche where you can identify a target market and you can identify the problems that people are having. Um, really, really immerse yourself in it. Um, I was going to do a uh, go out on the internet. I'm going to do that on the um, on the next section actually instead. So let me just stop this for a second. Any questions? BMWs are overpriced and unreliable. The only reason people think they're overpriced is because they think they have to go to the factory to fix it. Um, I can get a BMW um, fixed cheaper than I can get my Kia fixed, believe it or not, but not by going to the dealer. And I only know that because that's a, that is a niche I've immersed myself in. Um, what type of hairdress? Yes, yeah, so Simon, you already knew where I was going with that. Any questions on that? Is that pretty clear? Does everybody understand the importance of really dialing that down and, and go as, as deep and deep and deep and deep as, as you can get? Never go to the dealer. Absolutely correct. There's never a need to. But, but so many people do, and they've been ripped off by the dealers, and they paid too much money at the dealer, that that's a legitimate pain point for a huge market out there. So we can use that to our advantage. That, that sales page will write itself, right? Okay. Um, and so what I want to talk about next, unless there are any questions, um, I want to talk about developing a target market and not just an avatar. Um, okay. So let me go back to my screen share here. And next we're going to talk about whoops. Next we're going to talk about a uh, target market. And um, I am going to talk about a, an avatar for just a second, but I'm not going to um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. You can go to YouTube probably and type in how do I find it? How do I design a customer avatar? There's probably a thousand videos there you can watch to get that. It's actually a pretty easy process. Um, and if you don't know what I mean by avatar, an avatar is is a model. 
um, like a, um, a model customer, a model prospect, an ideal client that's just an, um, a sampling. You know, um, I know most of my clients are 27 year old females living in the suburbs with two kids, you know, um, that have a, a college education. That's an avatar. Um, and they're really easy to build. To build, but remember, we're going for a problem that they have so that we can offer a solution. Um, so, what you want to do is how can you identify that problem? Well, the only way to do that is to find that exact target market. Um, and at this stage of a funnel, most people only talk about the avatar. Um, it's just such a small piece of the puzzle. Let me let me actually take a second. I'm going to show you how to. Um, I'm going to show you how to find a. a make a really quick, easy avatar. Can everybody uh, make sure I'm still sharing? Everybody see I'm on magazines.com? Okay, um, what's on here on the first page? Parrots, okay. Let's say you think your, your avatar is probably someone who would subscribe to Parents Magazine. And by the way, magazines.com is a great idea to go through there and think about the type of people that read that, okay? If you're selling child's toys or educational products for kids or children's clothing, or maybe you picked up a, um, a local boutique is a client and you sold software to them and now you need to help them design some ad campaigns. Okay, the kinds of people that um, read Parents Magazine, that's that exact customer, right? So here's how you get, here's how you get an avatar. Let's go to Parents Magazine. Oh, there it is right there. And there it is, parents.com, right? Okay, the latest from Parents Magazine. It looks like I've actually been here before. Um, okay, so th this is a huge company. I believe, it's a, I see this on the news shelves for years. Scroll down to the footer. Let me give it a minute, let my page come. Scroll down to the footer, there we go. What you're looking for is something that says advertise, okay? What most of these magazine companies have already done is created a media kit for people that wanna advertise in their publication. Do you think Parents Magazine has already built an avatar for their readers and probably spent hundreds of thousands of dollars doing it? I want to find a media kit and usually, look at that, there it is. Usually it's on their website. If not, I could go up to Google and go Parents Magazine Advertising Media Kit and do a search for that. But look, they've got it right here for us. Let's see what they show us. Oh, look, they have two magazines. Look at this, Parents and Parents Latina. Okay, there's another niche, right? Duplicate that niche to the Spanish speaking audience. So let's go to the Parents Media Kit because I do not speak Spanish, so I probably can't read it. Okay, so this is gonna be, okay, look at this, they're telling you what's coming up. So, okay, does do magazine, <laughs> here's something interesting, do magazines pay attention to what is trendy? They do, so if you have a tool like this, and I can see what is, what is Parents Magazine gonna come up in, with in September? Ready for back to school, in-class guide, setting routines, I can see what they're doing. I can start to gear my marketing right along with them if I have that same, uh, target audience, they've already done the research and they've got the history to know what's going to sell coming up. But that's not what I'm looking for. Let's scroll down. I know we're going to find it. Look at this. Look at this. Here's our avatar. Median age, 39 years old, 56% millennials. Median household income, $64,000. 75% have kids, 5% are pregnant, 11% intend to get pregnant. Look at that. That's for Parents Magazine. And then here's separate demographics for the website. Now, if you're marketing mostly digitally, this is probably a better demographic for you to create an avatar from, right? Median age, 35, 57% millennials, a little bit higher, not much, but a little bit. Higher household income, 76K is the average. 60% have kids, 3% are pregnant, 12% intend to get pregnant. So a little bit more millennials, a little bit more money, less kids, but a slightly higher pregnancy percentage. So these are people on parents.com, I would imagine from what I'm reading here, are looking forward to having children and looking forward to becoming parents um, as much as the ones that read it that have it. So that, that's an easy way to grab your, the demographics anyway of your, your uh, and then the rest of this is just for advertising. But that's a really great easy way to get the demographics part of your avatar. Just figure out what magazines they're going to read Go to, go to find the media kit for that magazine and there's all the homework already done for you and they've spent the hundreds of thousands of dollars to get it. So hopefully that tip helps some people out. Um, <clears throat> okay, so 
if you've already done a, if you've done a really good job of dialing in the niche, the stage we were at before this, a lot of that target market will already be identified. You know, um, whether you're looking for brides or prom goers or, you know, BMW owners under warranty um, or, you know, the tennis players. Um, by the way, tennis right now is, I'm going to just throw this out there. Tennis is a huge niche right now. And I didn't realize why until last night. I hung out with a friend of mine last night, and he's a rugby player. Um, a really good one. He's been playing it for many years. But most of the local rugby clubs are closed due to COVID protocols and lockdowns. Well, what's a sport you can still play in the age of coronavirus? Tennis. So a lot of these groups of people that have been doing group sports are out playing tennis. The tennis, and he said this, and then today I looked at, out and there was, you know, people head before the storm hit, they were, you know, heading to the tennis courts. Um, so that's an interesting niche for right now. Um, just something to think about. Um, anyway, I'm getting off track. Um, so yeah, you've already identified the, the target market. You know, using examples above, we know we're talking about somebody ready to a, attend a prom or is engaged or, or anything like that. And the more you dial in the niche, the more obvious that target market becomes. Um, so that really is the key to finding that target audience. So go out and if you're really not sure, go out and find groups, Facebook groups, um, forums, blogs, and things like that for people in that sub-niche and start paying attention to the people there that are asking questions. Not the people providing the products, but the people that are buying those products and services. If they're in Facebook groups, you can click on their profile, you can read about them, you can see who they are, what other interests do they have. You'll start to identify common themes. Um, you'll start to identify other groups they belong to, their interests and things like that. It, it will absolutely become obvious only if though you've dialed that niche in really, really, really tight. Um, so. In a little bit, we're going to talk a little bit more about where they hang out. Um, and if you do that, you'll also see the type of language they use. So I'm going to talk in a little bit about why that's important and what their interests are. Um, you really need to know who you're speaking with and you need to know how they communicate um, and what they might be looking for in order to be truly effective. Um, you know, I already talked about grabbing and having that dialogue with the BMW guy. Um, how about having a dialogue with your neighbor that owns a BMW? Um, you know, if that's really a niche you want to get into, you know, what what problems do you have? What issues do you have? Do you have problems finding a mechanic? What do you love about your mechanic? Find out, you know, start talking to people in that target audience um, and listen to the language that they use. Um, remember, broad equals a waste of time and money and narrow equals more time and money. And that's really all I'm going to talk about this unless somebody has some questions because I want to I want to get into identifying problems, which will also help us narrow down that target. Um, audience a little bit. Any questions on that part? Is that clear? Does that help anybody? Okay. All right. Um, so find the problem, find the pain point. So let's go. I'm going to go back to sharing my screen then. And um, I probably didn't write very much down in that last one, did I? Because I was just mostly talking. I will put magazines.com. That's a great place to go for, you know, for avatar related stuff. Um, Magazines.com, uh, get the media kit. Advertise, it's called an advertiser media kit, is what you're looking for on that. Advertiser media kit. Um, go again, you know, Facebook groups. Where do these people hang out? Facebook groups, um, forums, blogs. If you're not sure of where these people hang out, okay, let's say you're you want to you want to help that um, hairdresser find those brides, right? And you're not sure where those brides hang out. Um, just search for, um, you know, new brides or think of a question a bride might have. Where do I get my hair done as a new bride? Um, where do I buy a dress? Where do you, you want to start find out where that target market hangs out and you'll all of a sudden in Google will give you forums, blogs, Facebook groups, all kinds of crazy stuff and then go join those groups and immerse yourself in that. Um, and, and pay attention. And as you pay attention, not only will you see the niche, you'll see the, the people that are in it. So what we want to do now is problem, okay? This is really where everything starts to fall in place, is developing, identifying rather. You're not going to develop the problems. They have the problems. You're just going to identify them and make them aware of it. This is the most important part of what we're going to learn today. Um, absolutely, completely, I want to repeat that. This is the most important part. If you're off doing other things, and you know, you've been chatting with the kids and eating snacks, now's the time to, to stop for a couple minutes. Um, anyway, um, 
if you haven't identified a problem, okay, this is how important it is. All you're doing is rolling the dice, okay? Um, this is where copy and paste systems fail and where broad strategies go to die, okay? They haven't identified a problem. This is one of the reasons I have an issue with those copy and paste funnels. You know, hey, I'll, I'll build a funnel for you, but I'm gonna sell it to 20 other people, you know, or do you, you know, they buy into a program, give me a funnel. That can only compete on price. Is price a problem? In some target markets, it may be, absolutely. Um, most of the time, price is not the issue. They have some other issue, and a copy-paste funnel will never, so, will never address that problem. And even if it does, if the person that designed that funnel has identified a problem, do you know what they're doing target market-wise? Do you know uh, who they're targeting their ads to? Are they doing retargeting? Um, are they doing outside advertising? What are they doing for a back-end follow-up program? You know, you usually have no idea. You're not going to get the results they're getting. It's just not going to happen. I mean, for one thing, if they're retargeting and they teach you how to retarget, if they've been doing it for two years, is your Facebook pixel um, going to be seasoned like theirs? Absolutely not. You're going to spend five times as much in Facebook ads as they are, at least for a while, um, which is why I think it's always better. Do this work here. It's more work, but do it. It pays off. Um, so, uh, yeah, the example, you know, is in the software industry, in the industry I am. People build websites selling software, and there's only one thing you can compete doing that, price. Well, I can sell it cheaper than the guy down here. I can offer an extra bonus. Will you make money? Absolutely. Can you scale that? Probably not. Um, it just becomes a race to the bottom until nobody buys. Um, and why is that? Because there's no pain point, right? There's no perceived damage being done to them or a damage that will continue to happen if you don't provide that solution. Um, there's usually not any personal in or industry language used. It's just general. You know, I have, a, I have a piece of software that can send texts out to your potential clients rather than did you just lose that listing because he went over to realtor.com and grabbed the guy from Remax down the street? What if I could have put that guy in your lap? Whole different conversation, whole different type of funnel. Let me give you an example. I have a, I'm working on this actually with one of the people on this call right now. We, we just started this. The, the friend of mine locally in town that gave me that barber client referral um, yesterday that I signed up, um, he's in a really interesting niche, and I'm not gonna, that I'm not going to divulge. Um, but we have a package of three products, and I'm not even going to get into what they are, but they're software products. One of them sells for $27 a month. One sells for $37. One sells for $97. Um, so that is $161 um, a month. Not bad. It's a good little package. It does a lot of great things. But he has a really specific targeted niche that we identified three problems that they're having that they would love to solve. We added one other little element to that, or we're in the process of adding it. That's what one of the people in this call is going to help us with. And we identify those three problems for them. We've got that little thing, and we're going to add a little extra value because we're going to give training to show how to tie those together. From our market research so far, we believe that package will sell from between $500 and $1,000 a month, easily, with an extremely high closing percentage. And there are thousands of people in this super, super, super tight sub, 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 sub niche, okay? This, I'm talking, this is a little tiny niche. We got a $500 to $1,000 a month product because we took the time to identify the problems, identify the solution, identify the target niche. Um, that's how important this is. If you can do that, all of a sudden that software you've been struggling to sell for $37 a month, you can add a couple of little tiny things to it and it is a $250 a month software um, because it solves a solution rather than just being a tool. So let's go through, um, oh, and by the way, that $500 to $1,000 a month, it's not just the target audience um, and the solution to a problem, but it's also that small value add that we added and using industry language. We have someone on board with us who knows that industry inside out and he speaks their language. Super important. So I'm going to give you a list of things here. How do you identify these problems that people have? Because this is the most important part. So how do you identify them? Okay, this is going to sound stupid, um, stupid, easy, and silly, and you're going to go, well, that's not going to work, but try it, okay? Go to Google and type in problems. I don't know. Uh, maybe you're a realtor, right? Problems realtors are having getting clients. If that's your niche, right? If your niche is realtors. Um, and type that in Google, right? You're going to find those problems that they're having. 
Google's already done the work. And people, I know people on this call are going to say, that's ridiculous. Well, let's go do it. Let's just paste that in there. Problems realtors are having, and whatever, I put it in brackets because whatever your sub, sub, sub niche is. Okay. Um, that's not really one we want. Look at this. 20 problems only realtors can relate to on Zerpel. Um, handling difficult clients, tricks of the trade, seven challenges of being a real estate agent and how to avoid them. Um, common real estate problems and their solutions, tips for real estate agents, how to deal with difficult clients. Obviously, look, in the, in the top thing on this, we, didn't we see difficult clients before? Look at that. Two, and there was no here, toxic, difficult. We've already identified something they're having, difficult and toxic clients. I would have never, I've been in the real estate market for a long time. I didn't, I've never identified that problem, actually. I've been doing real estate niche for six or seven years now. Um, that's a new one on me. Great. Well, guess what I'm going to do? Tonight when this call's over, I'm going to go down that rabbit hole and see if that's something I can build a sales page around um, and get even more realtors in. But, you know, if you click most of these, let's just click one. Let's go out there and take a look at it. See what we got here. The reasons, okay, this is probably not going to be what we want. Reasons agents fail. Um, they want a lot of free time. Okay, well, that's not a pain point, but that's a, if you can provide that solution, okay, we, what is it that realtors are doing that is causing them to not have a lot of free time? That could be a problem, right? Um, why aren't they making a lot of money? We've already identified one of those. They're losing leads because they're not on top of them fast enough. So even though this page is not really what we were looking for, we can identify some problems because of the, the things that it's trying to address there. Okay, let's go to, oops, that's the one I just went to, right? Um, and if anybody has a niche they want to, you know, do live on here, we can. But I think most people will get the example as we go through here. Let's look at this. Low inventory. It's not an issue now, I don't think, but it could be. Um, growing online competition from listing portals. Um, that could be a big one. So, you know, now we want to go to Google and type um, online competition from listing portals and go down that hole. And now's when you can call that realtor friend of yours. Hey, I understand um, the listing places that are online are starting to become a problem for you. Is that true? Get a dialogue going with somebody you know and narrow that down, not just what the problem is, but the specific pain points and why it's, why it's hurting them and why it's, problem, why it's um, problematic to them. Um, visit Facebook groups, forums, find blogs, okay? Find, if, you're a, if you are selling a product, right? Find competing products in Amazon, okay? And go to the reviews section. Look at the one-star reviews, right? You want to find out what problems people have with a particular product? Look at the one-star reviews in Amazon. Now, that may not help us if we're doing B2B stuff. It may not help us if we have a service. Um, this is just an example of something we can do. You know, go find those one-star reviews. And if you have, and not just for one product, you know, if you're selling, I don't know, I had a friend of mine made a ton of money selling little refrigerated wine cabinets, right? Little tiny things. They held eight bottles of wine, little refrigerated wine racks. Um, and this is one of the things he did. You know, he went out there and found all the 20 or 30 different companies that were selling refrigerated wine racks and went through all their one-star reviews and found those common problems amongst all of them. Not just with this product, but universal across the field with that market with that target market, what was, what was the problem? And um, he addressed those problems in his sales page and he's a top number one seller in that particular, at least he was a year ago, um, in that particular Amazon category. So that works for this too, you know? If you've got, um, you know, I just came out with a, with a software um, for messenger marketing and one of the very first things I did before I even built the software was I went out, I found the competition, I went out there and I looked for all the bad reviews. What do, what do people hate about the competition that's there? And if I can address those problems in what I'm building, I'm going to have great sales before I even start. Okay. Um, so that's why this is important. Um, when I say visit Facebook groups and forums, you know, do you think there are realtor, there are forums for realtors on Facebook? <laughs> Absolutely. Hundreds of them, actually. Um, and if you're not sure where to find them, go up here and go, Facebook groups for whatever your niche happens to be. Whoops. Facebook groups for, and then type in your niche. Skip down past the ads, right? Best real, look, here's the actual page for it. Best real estate Facebook groups in 2020. Facebook groups for real estate. Five Facebook groups every real estate agent should know. This may not be a group of real estate agents, but it's going to be a group where they hang out, right? at least somebody maybe it's a guru that they all follow you know 
Um, Tom Ferry is a big wig in the real estate industry. I go to all different places Tom is, and I find the people that are following them because that's my target market, right? So um, I want to ask those people what problems they're having. Um, I already did the products. If you're dealing with a product, find a competing product in Amazon. Interview people in the niche. This is so huge, so huge. Um, and I kind of talk, talked about this a little bit, but bribe them. You know, I'll buy you lunch if you let me pick your brain about your industry. Chances are, if you're getting into a niche, you know a little something about it generally, which means you know at least one or two or three people. And how many of you on Facebook do you think, if you put a Facebook post out and say, hey, I'm testing something out, about hairdressers, and I got a couple of questions. Who one here of my friends is a hairdresser would be willing to chat with me for 10 minutes today? Do you think you'll get some people to do that? Absolutely, okay? Interview people in their notes in that niche. Um, what you really wanna do, here's what you wanna ask them, right? You wanna have them identify problems to you. Have them identify problems they are having, and in that particular aspect of what you're doing. If you're interviewing hairdressers, find out their general problems, but also say, hey, would it help your business if you could get more brides in? Or you know, during prime season, if you could get more prom kids in, would, would that help you? Okay, well, what, what difficulties are you having doing that? When they do come in, what are they looking for? You know, what problems are you, is your customer having? Identify that, that they're having and that their customers are having, um, or clients, you know, depending on what they are. That's a really great way to get personal stuff. And then listen to the language they're using. What kind of words are they using? What kind of terminology do they use? Um, something else to do is interview people who've just purchased that product or service. Um, interview recent purchasers. Really important, okay? You know, easy to identify. You know, again, the BMW example. You know, you're in a parking lot at the grocery store, guy gets out of a new BMW. Compliment on his car. He'll stop. Thank you. People love getting complimented and then chat with him. Ask him those questions. How long have you had it? Where do you get it fixed? What issues are you having? You know, um, ask about problems. Um, ask about um, how, you know, it helped them. You know, if it's a service, especially, you know, if they went to a mechanic, well, how did, how did this mechanic help you over the other one? If it's a realtor, you know, what did you love about the person? Somebody had just sold their house, right? They obviously had a realtor. How'd you like them? How'd they help you? Would you what problems did you have with them? Um, did you have communication issues? That kind of thing. Um, and then here's an important one. What problems no longer exist because you bought whatever that is, that service or that product, all right? Um, there's where you start to identify your solutions. You know, what problems do you have that, you know, you can identify the pain point, but now you can also, what we're gonna get into next is a solution. You can start to help them visualize on those things. Um, the thing that you want to pick up on, okay, really important is not just the problems itself, but those pain points. You know, oh, I, I you know, I don't like this. It really bothers me, why? You know, be like a two-year-old, but why? Oh, because it makes me feel this way. But why? Well, because keep digging. Just be a, be a two-year-old and ask the why question, right? People, you'll eventually get and identify those pain points. These can become bullet points on your sales video uh, or your sales page at the top of your funnel when you're in that consideration phase that we talked about. After you, you're making them aware of things, when you want them to get consideration, you got to make them aware of those pain points before they can consider the solution. So it's all part of both of those first two stages. Um, and when I talk about pain points, I'm talking about current ones and future ones if they don't fix the problem, okay? And you want to make this really emotional when we start talking to a, to a target audience. Let me give you an example, okay? Um, a direct salesperson has a problem with getting in touch with leads fast enough. We know that. I don't care what industry. They could be a mortgage broker, a medical salesperson. They could sell the jets, you know? Um, if you're a direct salesperson, you have a problem getting to your leads fast enough. Even if you're on top of them, you still want to be faster. But identifying that problem is not a pain point, okay? That's just the beginning of the pain point. You have to really, really, really make them understand the damage that they're, that's getting caused to them and the damage it's going to cause if they don't take your solution to this, okay? Um, and in that case, what are we talking about, for example, with a direct salesperson? We're talking about lost business, wasted time, have a frustration of having to chase people down, literally handing deals to your competition so they get the money, 
okay? If you know how much that average deal costs to that particular salesperson, and if you're doing your immersion in the niche, you know exactly how much they make on an average sale. Um, hit them with that. How much money are you losing? You know, how many, how many leads you get out there? How many people sit for two days before you get in touch with them? 20. How many of them do you lose when you finally get in touch with them? 18. How many of those could you have gotten had you called them right away? You could have got, you think, a third of them, six of them maybe? Okay, great. What's your commission on six houses? Okay, uh, you lost 100 grand. Boom, that's their pain point. Okay, you want to really hit the pain point? Um, talk about the extra car they lost, the bigger house, the vacation they can't take, the early retirement. You know, asking questions like, do you really want to be working until you're 70 instead of 55? Just because you weren't willing to spend a little bit of money getting a tool to contact that lead right now. Now, you don't have to ask it, you know, kind of arrogantly like I just did, but hit that pain point. And if you, if you go through these, these searches and you, you talk to people and you hang out in the groups and you find what those problems are, now you want to find out what the pain points are with those problems. Um, it's usually going to be uh, money, time, uh, emotion. You know, maybe it's something that makes them not feel good. You know, uh, like in the hairdresser thing, looking for brides or prom people, you know, a lot of that's emotion. I want to look good, you know. Well, what's the pain if you don't look good? You know, do you want to be embarrassed? Do you want to get that picture you know, at the prom that looks horrible and you're, you're going to throw away instead of frame and hang on the wall? You know, that kind of thing. Find out what these pain points are because that's where, that's where the whole thing starts to pivot and, and work with itself. Um, and then remember why you're going through this. Look for language that they're using. Okay. Um, grab that industry terminology. You could go into, into Google and do something like glossary for realtors and immerse yourself in the terminology of a realtor or glossary for hairdressers so that when you're talking to them about hairstyles or you're talking to them about something, you really sound like you know their niche, okay? Or if you're from a customer's standpoint, um, there are, um, actually, let me show you this. If you type in words and phrases, words and phrases, um, what am I, oh, frequency, frequency finder. There are actually tools out there where you can type like a blog post in. Uh, right words is not bad. That's a pretty good one. I've used that one before. See, they have a phrase frequency counter, right? So you could, if you go out to a forum or you go out to these review sites and you copy a bunch of this information, paste it in here, find like a four or five word phrase, and all of a sudden it's gonna show you these phrases that appear again and again and again and again and again and again. Those you can copy and paste into your funnel, okay? That's where the copy and paste comes in because now you can literally copy and paste the language your target audience is using into the funnel. Well, now are they gonna to relate to you? Absolutely. You're, you're literally using their language. Um, that'll really, you know, that's what makes a funnel really pop is not only when you get, you've identified the problem and the pain points, but find the language that they're using. Um, and if, you know, your target audience is really what I'm talking about. Or if you're helping someone, if you're working like B2B kind of stuff and you're helping someone, their target audience, all right? And, and walk them through these processes. Or if, they're, if, if you're building this page, this funnel for them, then just use this. Um, that's kind of it for now for problems. Before we get into solutions, I want to stop. Um, Amazon has a major problem with fake reviews plus competitors. Yes, I do realize that happens. Um, but if you copy all the, you know, if you got something that's got a thousand reviews and you copy a bunch of them, I actually have a Chrome extension that will grab all those reviews and do phrase uh, frequency. You can't get it. Um, it's really expensive. Thank you, Lance. Um, it's really exciting. <laughs> I did a $12,000 coaching course, two-day weekend in Vegas, and the Chrome extension was one of the little freebies we got with it. Um, I think he sold it for like $300 a month. It works. You know, I mean, I know a guy who did this, the refrigerator example I talked about. The way he came up with all of his bullet points, he did that. He, he popped that, all the reviews into a phrases, and then put that language, that specific language in his bullet points, and he hit page number one within a week. Um, but yes, that is some, you're absolutely right. That's a, a major problem. You want to make sure you're actually where your market is. If you're going, if you do that with reviews, for example, keep in consideration what, what Simon says, but do that for those reviews. Then go into a, take a blog post and put it in there and see if you have similar recurring phrases. Go to a Facebook group, um, and, and just copy the page, you know, um, you can print, 
if you're on a Mac, I don't know if you can do this on a PC, you can print a web page as a PDF. And then you can go to convertpdf2word.com. That's a website. Load the PDF in there, convert it to Word. Now you can copy and paste it anywhere you want, like into a phrase and a frequency analyzer. Um, and again, find those phrases that they're using again and again and again and again. Um, let me um, let me actually put that in here. Phrase, or actually word and phrase is usually the way they term that. Word and phrase. Frequency analyzer, that's what they call that. But if you do, do please take what Simon said into consideration, because if you only went to one source and it's a place that had a lot of fake reviews, that may not be that actual audience's language that they're using. So make sure if you if you if the source is suspect, just go to multiple sources and then blend your materials. Um, by the way, when you do this, not only have you identified the problems, is your sales page starting to write itself? Is your sales video starting to write itself? Um, and in ways that they can really have that emotional connection. Um, so good, good stuff. Really, really, really important stuff. Any questions on any of that? Okay. Um, hopefully everybody's doing good. All right. So next we're going to talk about, oops, the dictionary. I didn't want to do that. Next we're going to talk about solutions. Okay, remember, you're, you can't just identify the pain points. You've got to get, get into this emotional place of pain. Now you need to offer a solution to them. A lot of the solutions are going to become super obvious as soon as you've identified not just the problem, but the pain point. Okay, um, the key here with a solution is don't tell or don't just tell, I guess I should say. Um, don't just tell. You want to show them. Okay, this needs to be that the, the solution needs to be experiential. Let me pop that up a little higher on the page because it looks like it's hopefully not too hard to see. You want the solution to be experiential, okay? Um, have them put themselves in the position of having already solved that problem, kind of like the opposite of what we just did. If we've identified their pain points and we're, we're nailing them on pain points in the sales letter and we're saying, hey, I understand you're you know, not getting leads fast enough. I understand, you know, you couldn't take a vacation this summer because your, you know, your competitor made a hundred grand more than you. Um, you took them through that pain, but now you need to make them have that same emotional um, feeling with the solution that you're giving them. Key, you can't take them from an emotional place and just put them in a headspace. Um, you're not going to have a real good ROI doing that. So um, visualize, you want to, you want to use language that helps them visualize and um, visualize and I don't know if this is even a word, but I use it all the time. I guess I'll find out if it gets underlined in red. Emotionalize. Oh, good. Okay, it is, I guess, a word. Um, visualize and emotionalize, all right? Have them put themselves in that position. Um, you know, we, we gave them that thing about you lost that deal, now you have to retire at 70 comment, right? What about, hey, once you get a hold of that lead in less than 90 seconds, who gets the deal? Who now gets to retire at 55 and not 70? Who gets that big boat? Who gets more time to spend with the kids instead of chasing them uh chasing down that lead now you can go you know play out in the yard with the kids in the evening um you know instead of having to chase down the lead that by the time you find them they're already working with your competitor anyway and you've wasted your time but you need to make them visualize that um speaking of which make sure that again what you're saying is one to your target audience if your typical person you're speaking to does not have kids for example um if you've researched the realtor market and you found most of them are older and their kids are grown, don't give that example I just gave. Don't say, you know, wouldn't you rather be spending time with the kids? You know, wouldn't you rather go out to dinner with your husband? Wouldn't you rather, you know, take an extra vacation? But whatever it is that you're using, make sure it's emotional. It's something that they would engage in and then say it in a word that they can visualize and, you know, emotionalize it. Use, again, just like we did before, use their language. Um, kind of the opposites of the pain points. If they've given you the language of the pain points, now you can just talk about, that going away, you know, that pain point going away and, and use that. Um, interviewing, again, interview people, right? But find people who have the solution, okay? Find the person who did just hire the hairdresser for a, for a wedding. Um, and you want to ask them, or interview the, the, the buyer, I guess we'll just call them for purposes of this. And you want to ask them, not just what the solution was, right? Ask them how the solution has impacted them in a good way. Now we're looking for feel good stuff, right? We're looking for emotions. That's a great question to ask them. Hey, when you, when that, the, you, I know, I saw you did a good review. If you, this is on Facebook, for example, okay? If you find a bride, she just got her hair done and she posted the picture on Facebook. 
you know, befriend her, ask her a question. Hey, you know, I, if you're a guy, it's okay too. I have a friend that's thinking about getting her hair done and I see you went to that hairdresser. Um, your pictures look fantastic. How did that make you feel? You know, what do you, and start getting emotive words from her and she'll start using the words that she felt when she was showing off her new hairstyle, just as an example, okay? Copy that language, get, the, get those words. Um, again, you can go out to blogs, forums. I'm not gonna retype all that, you know, just the, the, the usual suspects, actually I will. You know, go out to blogs, um, forums, Facebook groups, you know, anywhere where you can find um, review sites, okay? That's a good place, find people that left reviews or go to review sites, just make sure they're legitimate, you know, keeping in mind what Simon said, um, and talk to these people, interview them, or at least copy their language. And what you're going to find is a lot of the language they use in the solutions overlaps the language of the problems. Now you know you have a good fit, you know, you have a solution that, that fits that problem, and then just copy that, um, that language. So um, a good solution will have these, one of these features, one or more of these. All right, let me take a second and type this. One or more of these will be in a good solution. And these are pretty universal, okay? No matter what your target market is. The solution's gonna save them time, okay? Uh, the solution's gonna save them work or effort, which sometimes relates to time, but not always. Okay, sometimes people are still gonna spend the same amount of time doing it, but they gotta do it in a more difficult way, okay? Um, save them money, all right? Uh, say, uh, make them money, okay? Maybe it's gonna make them money. Might save the money, it might make them money. Oops, I got a little typo there. Sorry about that. Uh, what else do I have on my list? Make them look good. Here's our hairstylist, right? Make them look good. And this is usually to others. Make them look good, you know, as they, how they appear to others is what they really care about on these on these solutions. They care about the opinions of others um, a lot, you know. But find that out if you're not sure. Ask them, you know. Um, maybe it just makes them feel good. You know, the guy with the... The guy with the BMW who's able to get his car fixed cheaper, you know, you got a couple here, you know, you saved him money, you saved him work and effort, a little bit of the looking good, but you know, a lot of that kind of stuff, they don't know how it makes them feel when they got that nice car to drive around in with the top down, you know. Um, a big one that we don't think about, you know, um, improve their relationships. This is a really big one, okay? And that could be any relationship, right? Um, if you're dealing again with that salesperson, you know, it could be a, a relationship with a client. It could be a relationship with a spouse, um, with a friend, maybe even with a lover, you know? Maybe it's maybe you're improving somebody's relationship with, with you know, a boyfriend, girlfriend, what, whatever. Um, hit these points. But make sure that the solution you're offering not only solves the problem, but hits one of these points. Because if it hits one of those points, now you can take their language and convert that point of saving them time into something that you can emotionalize. You can make them visualize the time they're going to have on vacation or with their kids or with their spouse or maybe just in a hot tub with a glass of wine and, and bubbles, you know, I don't know, you know, whatever. Um, but take these seven points here, make sure your solution fits those, and then emotionalize them. Um, because they, you can't just say, oh, Oh, hey, if you get the, if you get the solution from me, you're going to save time. They don't care about that. If you get the solution from me, you know, um, you're, you're going to be able to take those extra couple of days vacation at the end of the summer when all the coronavirus stuff is lifted, hopefully. Um, now you got something that they can that they can deal with and and you know emo you can emotionalize that. Um, that's the end of that section, really. Um, oh shoot, I was not sharing my screen, was I? Let me open this up. Uh, and I'll just let you see this, okay? I'm not going to go back over this, but it's all on here. Don't just tell, show them. It's experiential. Visualize and emotionalize. Use their language. Interview people. There's places you can go find them and one of those solutions. So all that's written down for you. I thought I was sharing my screen, but I evidently wasn't. So um, any questions on any of that? Yeah, Jay, you, we're seeing you. You can, you can um, unmute yourself, I, I hope, and uh, holler out at me unless... Um, Mark is, Mark is in control of the group, so I don't know if he's locked everybody on mute, but you should be able to unmute yourself and ask questions if you need to. Um, any questions on that or any questions in the chat? No? Okay. Um, because you weren't seeing my screen, I think you still, you still got the point of that and you've got those notes that I took. Does anybody need me to go over anything I just went in that section? And if I can't hear you, you can type in the chat. Okay. So, um, we went through the problem and we went through the solution. I'll make sure I actually share my screen this time. 
I don't know what happened there. Um, okay, it looks like it is now. Now we're going to talk about the irresistible offer, right? Irresistible, is that right? Yep, offer. If you've done, oh, it isn't irresistible. If you've done the work above, you've got your sub niche, you've got your target market dialed in, you've identified the problems, more importantly, you've identified the pain points, you've found the solutions, they fit one of those seven categories, you're using their language and you've emotionalized it, your offer will write itself. It's pretty much been done for you. You, now you can present that perfect solution to a nagging problem to the ideal target audience. Make sure they feel the problem. Make sure they can visualize and virtually experience that solution. All you really need to do now is optimize the price points. All the other work's been done. Okay, now you can get down to the nitty gritty and optimize the price points. Um, if you don't have or if you're not sure that you have the right price point, do you know how to find the right price point? Anybody want to take a guess? Split test. And after you've done a split test, split test it again. And after you've done that, split test it again. All right. Again, one item at a time. And I'm when I talk about optimize, I'm not just talking about is your price too high? Most people think, oh, my products, I'm charging too much. I'm not getting the amount of sales I need. Well, guess what? More people have the problem that they're not charging enough. I did a, I did a workshop at a hotel. We used to do a weekly workshop at a hotel. I'm going back to the 90s now. And we used to give them for free. And we even had them advertised on the radio. And we would get three or four or five people in there. And occasionally we would do what I call a secret meeting. Nobody showed up, okay? And there was a, a guy, um, Brian, Brian Jones, I think, I don't remember his name. He was a talk show host on WBAL in Baltimore back in the day. And I had dinner with him one night and was telling him about, I can't get people out. I'm advertising on the radio even. I can't get people out to the meeting. He said, what are you charging? I said, nothing. He said, how do you make your money? I said, I sell videotapes and things at the end of it. Well, what do you make on a videotape? I said, 20 bucks. I, I, how much do you sell a videotape for 20 He says, great. Do this on your next meeting. Charge 20 bucks and give them a free videotape. And when people aren't going to come, they're not coming for free. How are they going to come for 20 bucks? But I took his advice and I put a flyer out and I charged $20 and we packed the room. We turned people away. We did not have enough seating. We violated the fire code. In my experience, that's usually the case. You're not offering enough. The price is too low. So don't be afraid when you're split testing to increase the price until you find that great ROI. Do you want to sell? you know, 70% of the people you present an offer to at $7 a month, or would you rather only sell 20% of them, but you're at $197 a month? Less work, a lot more money, and now your people are gonna appreciate that product more anyway. So when I talk about optimized price points, keep in mind, usually people's prices are too low. Um, it, it's kind of crazy and it's counterintuitive, but when you're split testing, try raising the price. If you think it is too high of a price, maybe it's priced appropriately for, um, for what you have, but maybe it's too much at one time. So think, is there a way I can offer payments? Can I split this out? Um, could I offer a slight discount if they pay me for more months? Um, you know, I have a standard offer with all my local people. Pay me for a year, I'll give you two months for free. You know, if I'm charging, um, you know, I don't know, $1,000 a month, give me 10 grand and I'll give you a whole year. You just save yourself, you know, $2,000. Um, so I'm not going to get too much into the irresistible offer. If you have the pain points and you have the solution and you've prevented them, uh, presented them in an emotional way, your offer will write itself as long as you can identify the, um, David McKinney has to run. Excellent. Yes. Yeah, I'll send you the recording, David. Um, you, the offer will write itself. There's nothing else you need to do. You've got their language, so you've already got the terminology. You, hit, you have the pain points, you have the solution. Just work out the price, okay? So I'm not really going to get into anything else on irresistible offer. It really will write itself. If you have a problem creating an offer, chances are you, you, one of four things has happened. You don't have a great sub-niche. You haven't narrowed it down enough. You don't have your target market narrowed down enough. You haven't identified enough pain points, or you don't have a problem I mean, a solution to the problem that you can turn into something emotional. Um, so if you have a problem with that irresistible offer, that's usually 
um, where, where you're going to have the issue. So I'm not going to really talk about that anymore. Um, let me go back to screen sharing and we'll go to the next. Is there any questions on the irresistible offer? I know that was a really quick one, but it really does write itself if you've done that. Any questions? Okay, I'm not hearing anybody. I don't know if you're all muted. You can always type in the chat. Okay, I'm going to share the screen. And the next thing we're going to talk about is, and this is going to be really quick because this is, I'm not going to focus too much on this, but I do want to talk about it. I want to talk about designing the per, whoops, designing the perfect ad or sales page, okay, um, and a means of collecting data. We're going to talk about two things, and they may seem a little bit not really um, related here, but uh, they are, okay. Um, there's a question that everybody has when they start creating this part of the funnel, right? Do you do an opt-in page and then you present all your information? Or do you present all your information and then take them to an opt-in page? And there's, there's something valid for each side. If you don't collect the information up front, okay, um, and they leave your page, then you're going to rely on a Facebook retargeting pixel, perhaps. Or maybe you don't have that. And now they're gone. Um, you've lost them. But then you have the other side of the coin. What if I ask for their information before I've been able to properly identify their problem and solution and I lose them and didn't even get a chance to go through the awareness, consideration, and conversion stages? Um, it's a dilemma. But again, there are two, th two things you can do. One, split test it. Throw a hundred ads, uh, throw a thousand ads out there with trying to get the information up front, throw a thousand ads out there with presenting the information up front and getting the data on the back end or getting the data on the front, which one gets you better results. That's one way you can do it. Um, the, the other way you can do it is pay attention to some of the offers. Some of the offers will dictate themselves, okay? For example, that realtor that we've talked about that's trying to capture that lead from the internet, collect that data first. And you can, you can do that easily because that person, their pain point isn't really the issue right there. Um, they just want to see this house that they're interested in, right? So you're dealing with a solution, and the solution is, let me get you more information on this house, and I can get you great information. Now, you can hit some pain points along the way, but really that person just wants information at that point. So great. Now you can present it. You can tell them, hey, give me your information. I'll be in touch with you, you know, in five minutes, or I'll send you a, a virtual tour of the property. <clears throat> or, excuse me or something like that. So in a case like that, you want your data collection first. Now, once you got the data and you've reached them, now you can go over the pain points. What pain points? Well, you gotta identify the market. Maybe of finding a bad realtor. <clears throat> Maybe of not hiring a realtor. Maybe of not knowing what to look for, not having proper counsel going through. Whatever those pain points really are in that market, now you can talk about them. <clears throat> Excuse me. In other cases, trying to collect that data up front is never gonna be a good idea. Okay, especially if you're dealing with higher ticket items or you're dealing with services. Let's say you're a massage therapist or a hairdresser. Unless you're offering a coupon and they have to give information to get a coupon, which is not always the best way to bring them into your funnel, um, are they going to give you their name and phone number? No, probably not. So you want to give them, you know, put those pictures of the prom up for that hairdresser or that wedding where you've got that potential bride, you know, that, that is your target audience. <clears throat> um, you know, put some put things on there make them feel that pain. And now they're like, she's the one I want. She understands me because you've used their language, you've hit their pain points. Now they'll give you the data. So whichever one comes first, sometimes is, um, you know, you can do split testing to find out, but sometimes um, just really think about, um, think about the buying process. You know, think about the, the, the funnel process actually is really what I should do, the, the initial stages. Um, and, and it should write itself. Now, here are things that you need for an ideal sales page or um, an ad. And again, this is not a class on creating these things, but I do want to touch on these. Okay, some things you need to keep in mind when you're doing that. You need to, as we've talked about all along, right, use their language. Use appropriate imagery. Okay, we haven't talked about this yet. We did talk about how to find that language, how to find those frequent phrases and things like that. But do the same thing for pictures. When you're out there on those forums or you're on those blog posts, what images are being presented to you? Um, you know, we talked about going to magazines.com for that avatar. Leaf through a, a parents.com and, you know, if that's your target, and look at what kind of images those advertisers are presenting. They'll, the imagery will present itself, but make sure you're using appropriate imagery and find it the same way you found the language like we went through before. 
Um, you have to make sure that this, this sales page or ad is designed, and again, we talked about this before, but it needs to be reiterated specifically for your ideal target audience. You know, I'll go back again to some of these copy and paste funnels. You know, if you're selling an ebook as an affiliate and you're just going to copy a funnel from somebody, or if you're selling software and you're just going to copy a funnel, are you sure that's your ideal target audience? Has it been specifically designed for them or is it just offering software? Or is it just offering an ebook? Or is it just offering, you know, whatever the product is? So make sure it's specifically designed using all the things we talked about before. And speaking of which, make sure you present the problems and you already have the pain points, right? Make them feel that pain, okay? It sounds cruel, but it's really important. You gotta make them feel that pain. And again, not just the pain points now, but the pain points they're gonna have if they don't take the solution, which is you have something else you have to have on there. You have to demonstrate the solution, okay? Don't just talk about it, demonstrate it. And again, make them experience it, all right? This needs to, to be an emotional, experience for them, right? Make sure they can experience not just the solution, but the results of the solution. Again, what we talked about earlier, you know, people don't care about, well, maybe they do, but most people don't care about as much if they have extra time as what they can do with that time, right? Going on vacation or retiring earlier or whatever it is, you know, make, make sure you're emotionalizing it. Um, address, oh, it has to have um, a call to action, right? Um, this might sound silly. I see this on a lot of local business websites. Here's who I am. Here's what I do. They have no problem. They might have had a solution, but they haven't really even identified the problem first. But there's no phone number. There's no email address. There's no exit pop-up that's going to try to collect information. You have to search to find them. If you've got a buy button or a download button or, hey, I need your information before we can take the next step, whatever that is, make sure you have a call to action and make sure it is obvious i you have no idea how many wait, go out there once and look up like um i don't know pick any industry in your in your area movers or well movers are actually pretty good with this but maybe roofers or plumbers or electricians or hairdressers even and you'll be surprised at the number of websites that don't have any kind of call to action you have to go searching for their contact information here's a big one social proof right we talked about this a little bit at the very beginning of the call we said you get them through this through this funnel right and you got them to the point where they have that that like, know, and trust feeling with you already. They're ready to take their wallet out again. They're ready to become a loyal customer. Maybe not at the advocate stage yet, but you know they're almost at that point. Um, you want them to see the social proof, and once they're on the other side of that point, you want them to provide social proof for the next person coming through the funnel. So make sure you know you're giving them that social proof here on the ad or on the sales page or on the, the information, wherever that consideration or awareness stage is. Um, and then make sure as soon as you get past this point, we're past the point of conversion and we're going into the point of loyalty that we talked about, make sure you're asking them for that social proof. That's probably the, the, this is one of the most powerful, let me actually type this here, this is one of the most powerful business assets you will own. Um, if you're just starting out and you don't have clients yet, seriously consider, I, I rarely tell people this, but it, if you're new, this is something that you can do. Seriously consider offering a couple of free or super, super, super discounted um, items or products, but you have to do it in exchange for a really good in-depth testimonial. Get social proof. Maybe interview them on a camera for five minutes so you can take a 30-second clip here for this ad and a 30-second clip here for your, for your Facebook page and a 30-second clip here for your sales page and that kind of thing. Do it because that, that social proof is huge. Um, and put that social proof near a call to action, by the way. Um, you need to let them know, and this should probably, oh yeah, let them know what happens when they leave or if they leave. And this will need a little explanation, okay? Um, what I mean by this is let them know what happens post-sale, okay? If you're offering a service or a product and they can buy it, great, but you want to give them a little bit of a, uh, an awareness of what's going to happen after they've done that. Hey, you're going to get an email from me. It's going to have, it's your cell software, for example. It's going to have a username and a password. I'm going to give you a link to training videos. Hey, I've got a private group over here. You're going to be able to join that. You know, let them know what that process is. And you can hit on the, make sure you're, it's not just a dry process. Hit on these emotional points we talked about in the solutions. You know, you're going to, 
you're going to get that access, you're going to get that um, username, you're going to get that password, you're going to, um, you know, then immediately within a week, you're going to start saving time, you're going to start saving money, you're going to, what, what are these things up here, right, we're going to, you're going to look good, you're going to feel good, you know, you're going to be, uh, you know, have a better relationship with your client, be a better friend or lover, you know, whatever, whatever it is. When you're talking about what happens when they leave, you can, again, hit on those solutions and, and drive those points home. And if they leave, what if they don't? What happens if they don't? People don't think about this. I'm going to walk them through the process. What happens if they leave? And you can do this in an exit pop-up. Somebody tries to leave. Whoa, what are you doing? You really still want to spend all your time chasing down clients instead of playing with your kids? Hit the pain points. Let them know what's, remind them of what's going to happen if they leave that funnel. You know, and hopefully you're retargeting and using Facebook pixels and things like that, or you've already captured their information and you can, you know, you can try to bring them back into the loop, but let them know what happens um, when they, when they leave um, or if they buy. Okay. When they leave the site, either as a non-customer or as a customer, let them know what's going on. And then I just mentioned this, but think about retargeting. Okay. And, and this can go either way, right? Whoops. Um, if they leave and they didn't buy, you're going to retarget them to try to get them back in the funnel or target them with a related thing. Maybe you've only identified one problem in the sales page. You have another sales page with a different problem that you know that same target has. Well, great. Retarget them and now show them next week they get seen this ad. Same solution, different problem. Maybe they didn't resonate with them. They didn't feel enough pain on that problem, but you present this problem to it next week. And all of a sudden that solution, they, they feel the pain and that solution is perfect. You can do that through retargeting. OK, so um, just things to think about um, and, and, you know, exit pop ups. I talked a little bit about that. Make sure you have them and design them. You, a, a good exit pop up will um, identify the pain points again. OK. Um, and then one other thing to think about, because kind of at the bottom of the sales page, at the conversion stage, right, when, when they hit that conversion stage, start thinking about things like bump orders. OK. Um, add to cart items, okay, additional things you can sell even during the the, the checkout process. Right? You can do post-sale stuff, which we're going to talk about in just a minute, but um, think about things that you can add right now to increase your ROI, but if you do that, be careful, okay? Um, make sure they are closely related offers. Whoops. Okay, maybe it's a done-for-you solution, right? Maybe you're offering them a tool if you're selling software, for example, maybe you're offering them a text marketing tool. Um, hey, for an extra $197 one-time fee, I'll write all of your original campaigns for you. If that's a closely related offer. It's something that if they decide not to take it, you haven't taken anything away from the solution. They still feel the pain. They still feel the pleasure of the solution you're offering. If you start offering things that make them feel like they're not going to get that solution you promised if they don't take that upsell, you risk losing the offer. That would be better as an add-on after the sale, um, if that's the case. Or maybe not at all, maybe a week later through email marketing. But really important, make sure they're closely related offers. You know, if, you, if, you're, uh, you know, if you're the hairdresser, for example, and your offer is a, you know, a, a prom nails and makeup and hairstyling and everything for you know, 150 bucks, and they're checking out and say, hey, for another $50, we can get you, you know, your next six oil changes for free. You've lost that customer, okay? Um, they're just not there. Um, that's really it. I don't, I'm not going to talk anymore. I'm, we're not going to build a sales page again. I've done that on other videos and things. I'm happy to do that again for you if you want somewhere else. Are there any questions on that section? And if you can't unmute, you can type in chat. Anything else on that section? Coming down the list here, we got, we're going to talk about the thank you page, upsells, downsells, and cross promotions. We're going to talk about post-sale marketing and repeat business and creating advocates. And then we're going to talk about scaling. And then we're done. Um, we've been going for an hour and 45 minutes and everybody's hanging in there. So I appreciate that. Hopefully you're getting some good value. All right. I don't see any questions. I don't hear any questions. Thank you, Simon. I appreciate that. All right. I'm going to go back into screen sharing. Thanks, Diesel. I'm going to go back into screen sharing. And I'll actually do it this time, right, instead of that one I missed. And we're going to talk about, whoops, there we go. We're going to talk about the thank you page. I'll format all these. This is all in the same text and stuff. I'll format this a little better and clean it up before I send this out to you. We're also going to talk about upsells, downsells. This stuff I'm going to kind of fly through, but this is really important because by the time you've done this, you've already done your ad spend, right? These are direct increases on your return of investment. 
the ad spend's already been done. You've already got the customer. And remember what we talked about earlier? When is the best point to get somebody to pull out their wallet and give you money? If you remember from earlier, when they just gave you money, okay? Do you want fries with that? It's a lot better after they've ordered their burger um, rather than when they first walk through the door. Um, and that's a horrible example for me to give because I don't even eat burgers. But anyway, it's an example everybody can understand. Um, so let's talk about this just a little bit, okay? You have to let them know what to do next. Really important. And what I mean by this is actually do some hand-holding, okay? I like videos on thank you pages. I don't care if it's a coupon for a hairdresser or a nail salon or a restaurant. If that's the offer and what the funnel's being built for, you know, I used to do marketing for a, a little local pizza shop in the town I used to live at before I moved up here. And that owner was great. I say, you know, Sal, we need to do a video of you thanking people for getting on there and that you're really looking forward to them coming in and, and using the coupon and tell them to make sure they come up and say hi to Sal. Do people do that? Some of them will, most won't. But do they love having the owner talk to them and thank you them for going through this funnel? They love it. Absolutely love it. That's how you create that loyalty. That's how you create that advocate. Um, is create that personal connection. Remember, I'm going to go all the way back to, actually, I've got it right on here, right? Let me go back up to the very top. Remember our definition of a funnel, right? A tool used to bring potentially ideal clients to a point of connection, all right? Make sure your thank you page fits that word. Make sure you're connecting with those people, okay, personally. And I recommend video. Some people don't want to get on video. That's fine. I really don't care how you talk, how bad your dress is, your look, how, how ugly you think you are. I mean, I, I'm not the greatest looking guy. I have no problem getting on camera. People love talking to a face. Um, if you're really, really shy, do a presentation style video where you're showing them a picture of you that you've had, you know, taken or staged or glamour shot or whatever, but make that connection and then let them know what to do next. If, you, if you've sold them something and you don't have another offer to give them, great. Go here to download your product. Um, here's a form to fill out to work with me as a client or, you know, if you're a coach or whatever you happen to be doing, make sure you let them know step A, step B, step C, and make sure they have um, a way to contact you. Make sure they have points of contact, even if it's just a help desk, right? Even if it's just a help desk where they can go and put in a support ticket, make sure there's a point of contact on that thank you page. Nothing is more frustrating to a buyer than they've gone through this beautiful funnel. They felt all that pain. They felt all that pleasure. They're so excited they're going to get rid of this pain and get the solution. And then they have a problem and they can't reach out. You just killed the connection. It's gone. You'll never get that trust back. You might, but it's going to be a lot of work. You just go get a new client, okay? Um, so keep all that in mind when you're going through the, the thank you page. Make it personal um, and make it a video. If, if you know, and if you're shy, <laughs> I don't really care. Just do it. Um, but I, I get that. But I really do. And then over deliver. Add a surprise, okay? Um, Add a surprise. Give them something extra. If you're selling something, you know, I'll give you an example. My realtor, some of them, I do a particular marketing funnel that I send realtors through. One of the things we're going to do is have them build landing pages. And um, I use a, a software called LinkWizard that some of you are familiar with. And they can put images on an opt-in form on there. But those images have to be an exact size, right? So I had 100 of those images made at that exact size. And I don't mention that anywhere in the funnel. But when they get to that thank you page, oh, by the way, one of the tools, you're going to want images. Here are 100 images that you can use. They're already sized for that tool. And here's a video of how you can upload them into Canva and edit them, put your picture, your logo on there so that they can be personalized to you. They didn't know they were getting that. Now, how is that for creating loyalty, right? Whatever you can do. And if you've gone through the processes and you know the problem, you know the pain points, you know the solution, you can think of a really good thing to give them that will fit that whole scenario. It, it'll, it, the, the, whatever it is that you have to add as a gift will write itself. Um, it really will. Um, and if it doesn't, then as you start working with people, find out what they feel like they're missing. Again, interview them, and they'll tell you and go, great, let me build that for you. What if I gave that to you? Would you give me a testimonial if you haven't gotten it, right? All that testimonials. And now you have that tool, and you can give it to everybody else down the road, and you can start over-delivering. But also sell them something. Okay, sell them something. Once they bought something, sell them something else. Just make sure it's, again, just like we did up in the sales page, right? Up here, make sure it's a closely related offer. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna even copy that right there. Make sure it's a closely related offer. 
um, and make sure it's something that doesn't make them feel like you didn't give them the full solution. Hey, you have a full solution to those problems. By the way, do you also have this problem? We can help that too. You know, you can introduce new problems in a subtle way with solutions. Not as blatant as you did on the sales page, but same process, exact same process. Um, and you can do that through upsells and downsells. I think most people in here know what those are. An upsell is basically when you say, hey, here's something else I have. Do you want it? And if they say yes, you give it to them and take them to another thank you page. Again, with another video, make it personal, maybe sell them something else um, and over deliver that. Um, but also a downsell. If they say, no, thank you. I'm happy with what I got. Oh, well, what if I could give you this for a lesser price? You know, it's a smaller bit of what you were offering. Maybe if it's a software, a lower plan level, or, um, you know, if it was a, if you're a coach, maybe, you know, maybe not a year package, maybe a month or, you know, whatever it might be, whatever you're offering, come up with something you can downsell and then cross promotion. This is huge. Let me write this one down. People miss this. Lots of people miss this. This is really big. This can be really big in, um, in the local niche markets. Okay. If you're selling software and you're doing B2B, you're going to be working with these local niche markets probably. Um, have them reach out to people in their chamber of commerce, people in their network groups, people, you know, the mechanic, where do you buy lunch? You know, oh, you go to the pizza guy across the street. Well, chances are, if it's a local business, they've at least seen these other businesses and they know them. Now you can do cross promotions with them. They should be related, but they don't need to be as closely related, okay? The hairdresser, you may not want to offer the oil change coupon as a cross promotion, but maybe, um, you know, hey, you're going to have to do a rehearsal dinner somewhere, and here's a really great Italian restaurant, and they've said anybody who buys this package from me that you just got, and we're going to make you look beautiful on your, on your special day, but anybody who got this and sets up their rehearsal dinner at their restaurant gets this deal. There's a good cross promotion. Um, and then talk to them and have them advertise what you've got. You know, when they get, when they get dinner parties in, you know, they can, they can advertise the service you have. Take advantage of that. Even in the software industry, um, I do I do cross promotion all the time. Okay, I do it with other software providers. We cross promote each other's products. Um, a cross promotion I do. I'll give you an example of one I do in the real estate niche. Um, when people come in and they want to do marketing, the real estate people have a really long retargeting funnel, right? Because the average person buys a house every five years, so they really want to get that customer back because the commissions are huge, and they want to get referrals along the way because the National Association of Realtors has said, everybody you know will give you, if you're a realtor, we'll give you three to five qualified leads every year. If you know 50 people, there's 150 leads if you can get those people to give them to you. Um, we know that, and I know that because I've immersed myself in the niche I function, right? But how's this for cross-promotion? How do you keep them at the top of their mind for five years? Well, you could sell social media services. What I sell is a magazine. I sell them a printed publication. It comes out every two months. It looks really professional. It's nothing controversial. It's about art and travel and leisure and food and, you know, things that people love. But it's personalized with their picture on it. And they can put a back cover with testimonials and listings of their houses. And every other month, these and it looks like a gift. But it's a marketing tool for the agent. So this is another marketing tool I can sell them. It's 100 bucks a month. I get a little commission every month. And it's great. That's a cross-promotion. You know, I went out and I found this magazine company. I said, hey, I can promote this because I've got people coming in my phone. And then it works the other way. I can go out to offices and sell the magazine. And I can say, hey, how would you, do you need, how would you like to get a hold of customers quicker when they fill out forms on the internet? Or how would you like to, to automate these customers you're talking to throughout through text marketing, through voice, ringless voice messages? So I can cross promote those two products back and forth and increase my ROI on both sides of the fence. So think of those types of offers that you can do, and a great place to put them is right on that thank you page, right after they've come through the funnel, right while they're hot, they're gonna appreciate other offers like that. Um, and then this is, on the thank you page, probably the most important thing, because in the long haul, this will give you the longest, best ROI over time, get a testimonial. But that sticky reviews link on there, where they can go out to a page and they can type something in, they can record an audio, they can get on video right there on the website and hit send, and boom, they got their testimonial, and now they can get more social proof to make that funnel pop more powerfully, make people more comfortable going through it. Um, and again, with the testimonials, we've already said this, post the good ones to the website and the bad ones, oh man, why, why, did, why are they uncomfortable? People will do that. Oh, I just bought this and you sold me an upsell. Why'd you do that? Well, great, that's a testimonial I'll take because it tells me I probably want to take that offer off. It's not closely related enough or I haven't presented it in a proper way. That's great information to have. It's valuable. Um, so make sure you're doing that kind of stuff. 
So that's really all I'm going to talk about, about thank you pages, downsells, upsells, cross promotions. Any questions on any of that? Derek, yep, absolutely. Oh, I will. Absolutely, Derek, you, you can count on it. Um, excellent. Uh, yes, I'll get you that. Lance, he's already gone probably. This has been a long one. I thank everyone who's still hanging on here, and we're still recording. Thank you, Mark. Um, we are we are coming down home start. Two more categories to run through, and they'll be quick. But any questions? Any questions? Nothing in the chat. Okay. Post sale marketing. I'm not going to talk a lot about this, but this is really important. Post sale marketing. Remember our our stages. Let me scroll back up here again. Remember our stages um, that we went through at the very top. Okay, we've got the conversion. Now we're starting to do loyalty, and we want to go into the advocacy. Um, stage of all of the all of the funnels, right? So we're going to talk about post sale marketing, repeat business, and I'm only going to talk about this for a minute or two because, again, we've already covered a lot of this and creating advocates, which is really important. Repeat. There we go. Um, again, I'll I'll make this all look pretty later. Um, make sure you're doing follow up. I think most of the people on here have access to tools that can do email, text, uh, ringless voicemails. Um, direct mail. I've done direct mail. I don't do too much of it anymore, but I used to do a lot of it and it's really effective. And what you want to give them when you're doing these follow-ups, you want to give them information. You want to show, you want to give them updates. Okay, whoops, updates. And most importantly, you want to show care and concern. Okay, only occasional sales pitches at that point. You can sell them right away. Sell them on that thank you page. But when you start doing follow-up, don't sell them quite so often. Okay, whoops, I put an extra S in there. Um, don't, don't sell them too much on this follow-up. This is about creating an advocate. And, you know, and if you're doing software, for example, an email the next day, hey, did you get logged in? If you have any questions, let me know. A couple of days later, hey, I, have you gone through the training videos yet? If you need any help, let me know. A week later, hey, your thing should be up. Maybe this is a voicemail. Yes. You can't, see the can't see the screen. Thank you. I did it again. That's twice. Thank you. There we go. Okay. Thank you. Are we good now? Okay. So post sale marketing repeat. Business. So here's your follow up, right? Only occasional sales. Okay. Um, your your software. Let me just reiterate that. Did you get it downloaded? A couple of days later. Did you get it installed? A couple of days later. Did you watch the training videos? A week later. Do a voicemail. Do a ringless voicemail or give them an actual phone call. Hey, are you all set up? You should have your campaign set up if it's a D, if they're doing it themselves, right? Do you need any help? Do you want to hop on Zoom? Can I help you? You know, do that over delivery. You can do that here too. This is how you create advocates, right? This is part of the funnel. And I'll, and I'll tell you, some people don't think of post-sale marketing as part of the funnel, but it is. And the reason is once you've created that advocate, what happens? They send you business of people they go back into the awareness stage and through the whole funnel again, and you didn't have to pay for them, okay? You only had to give a little bit of follow-up and show people that you care. And if you really do, then that's easy. It's a no-brainer. Um, do you have a referral program? I'm not going to go back into that because I've already told people what my, what my standard one is. Um, do, you have, do you have swag? Okay, I told you when I signed up that barber yesterday, he gave me a T-shirt. He's going to give 1,000 T-shirts out. Do you have swag? People will wear that. It's advertising, especially if they're loyal customers. You want to get a testimonial? Give me a testimonial. I'll mail you a t-shirt. People love that kind of stuff. Do you have incentives? Now, don't buy leads. I mean, don't buy, um, don't buy testimonials is what I mean. Sometimes in some situations, in some industries, that's illegal. Uh, if you're dealing with the financial industry, for example, or if you're dealing with products and you're selling on Amazon, incentivizing testimonials could be either illegal or a violation of the, of the sales platform. But if it's allowed, use the testimonial, just like the barber guy, you know, hey, you just got his haircut. I'll give you 50% off your next appointment, but you got to schedule it now and you got to pay me up front. Pay me now, schedule it now. Do you want it? There's an incentive to get people back in and create that loyalty. That's what you're really doing here is creating loyalty, right? Oops, just about it. I'll fix it. Creating loyalty. Okay. That's the whole point of this. And of course, you'll get extra sales. You'll get extra money from them. But more importantly, you'll have a loyal customer who will bring you more business down the road. And that's really the thing. Get them talking about you. Um, invite them to the groups. Get to know them on Facebook. Invite them as a friend. Tag them in groups. Engage them publicly. Make comments. Give shout-outs on Facebook to your customers. 
you know, hey, so-and-so just joined my program. You get the permission first, but so-and-so just joined my program. You know, hit them up if you have any questions about me. Talk about them, and then in turn, that'll get them talking about you. Um, and it puts new people back in the funnel with only one thing missing, and that's the ad cost to get them there. So um, that's it for that. And at the risk of stopping sharing, so I don't, any questions on that? I only have one more section to go through. Um, Simon, I am going to, well, you're in a group that I'm in that I'm going to publish it on. I'll put it, um, I'll send anybody else who wants it. Uh, I'll see who's on here. I'm going to PM you all a link to it. And I may put it on YouTube. I'm not sure. Um, and Mark, uh, thank you. Mark is still with us. Um, <clears throat> good. I appreciate you recording this. That's great. Okay. So I have one more thing I'm going to talk about scaling. And I call this section, then what? Right? Um, any questions? So far, on what we've gone over, because that's your funnel, basically. Um, we've got it from start to finish. There's uh, all the psychology and all the points to put in there and everything. Our funnel is done, but if you only do that once, you're only going to make a minuscule amount of money compared to what you could do. So the next section I call then what, right? And let me type, let me share my screen. Um, bum, 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 bum. There we are. Okay. So all right. Then what? And this is all about scaling. Okay, and let me take some notes here so you can see it. Um, a couple of easy ways to scale. I actually already talked about one is find a new problem with the same audience. This is the same technique, technique you're using on that thank you page where you want to do an upsell, add another problem to the mix that you can solve. Not something that will interfere with the problems you already have or make them think you didn't give them everything for that problem, but a new problem with the same audience. You can use that to create a new funnel and go back and advertise again, you'll get a whole different audience coming in because they this is all problem-based. They're gonna come in if they have the problem, especially if you target it like we've talked about. If you identify that problem in the ads, they're gonna come back in the funnel. Well, now you don't have to do your audience again. You don't have to do your market again. You don't have to get the language they're using again, maybe a little bit of it related to that problem, but a lot of your homework is already done and proven. Just go find a new problem for them to do. You can also do a slight variation on the sub-niche. Right? <clears throat> For example, I talked about the hairdresser doing brides. Well, do proms. <clears throat> you might only have a certain time of year you can do that, but if you've got that bridal funnel built, switching that over to a lot of the pain points are identical. So switching it to prom girls, they're going to be worded differently. The language is going to be completely different, but the problem is the same. Again, a lot of your work is already done for you. You only have to do some of the work. You can also do a slight variation to the target audience. Okay? Um, there, there may be target audiences that have the same problem and need the same solution, but what's going to be the difference here? They usually use different language, okay? Um, maybe in the example of the auto mechanic, right? If um, he also wants to get into, I don't know, Audi um, audiences instead of just BMWs, the problems are the same, especially if he's doing certified work or, or warranty work. The, the problems are the same. The language is very similar. It's just you need to change some of the language to capture that audience crowd. The target audience is a little bit different. Again, most of your work's done. Just do a little bit. And then you can also do a new niche that may have the same problems, okay? Um, an example here, um, our realtor that we targeted that only did waterfront properties. Well, let's find a realtor that only does farms or that only does um, – condos in, in not heavily, heavy, heavy metropolitan areas, those people have very similar problems, okay? Those realtors do. Their target audience may have different problems, but the realtors have almost the same problems. That's been my experience. Um, but it's a little different sub-niche. You can, you can, you know, you're, you, you can move to a, to a new sub-niche. You can also move to a new niche. You can go from residential realtors to commercial realtors. Those problems are not the same, but they're similar enough that, again, a lot of your work's already done. So once, that's the easy way to scale. Keep that phone rolling, collect that money, keep that thing cycling back, keep everything rolling. And um, I don't think I need to share anymore. Keep everything rolling on there. Let everything cycle back in. Let that, now it's on autopilot, right? Now go over and build a new funnel with those little slight variations and then build another one with slight variations and another. You know, again, going back to the copy-paste software, if you're just putting copy-paste funnels out there on software, you're done. That's it. Okay, there's your funnel. Good luck. I hope it works and you'll get sales. But now if you got a funnel to solve this niche's problems and solutions, you're gonna get great sales for a lot more money 
Now you can copy and emulate that and build the next funnel for this target audience or for that new sub niche or using a different software for the same um, problem. Now you can, you're dealing with upsells and also maybe a new funnel. And then you can bring those people in, you can start selling the opposite. So this problem, person had problem A and you upsell them problem B. This person has problem B, so you're attracting them initially, but they also have problem A, so there's their upsell. You're just flipping the, the um, sales page and the, the upsell on the thank you page. Um, because again, you'll attract a different audience in and get new fresh people in your funnel. That takes no work. It's just technically of reversing everything. You've already identified the problems. You've already have the sub niche. You've already identified the audience, everything. And, um, but you need, to, you need to do the work. You know, again, I said at the beginning, a lot of people don't like this because it requires work, but the results, the rewards, amazing. Absolutely fantastic. My wife and I, I've been doing this a long time. My wife and I, when we're not in coronavirus, take 11 to 12 weeks of vacation a year. We, we average a week a month. We're gone. Now, we haven't been for six months, which is great because that's how I was able to develop my last software. I had, was getting out stir crazy. <laughs> it needed to work. But if you get these funnels working, you can go do what you want to do because they'll do the work for you. I'm done. I'm finished. Um, any questions? Any feedback? Um, let me see if I can. I think I can take back the... Let me see if I can take back the host again. I think I can. Uh, let's see. Maybe not. Okay, Mark may have to give me that host back. Um, I'm look. I'm looking on it. Okay, and we and we can kill the recording anytime you want. I'll I'll do some. We can chat a little bit if you okay. want, and then if you can, I'll shut the I'll shut the send that.